All right, there we go. We are live uh, on Facebook and on YouTube, and I think we're over on my Twitter too as well. Uh, if you're seeing this, you probably know who I am, but I might as well tell you. I'm Brian Stevens. We're actually here in my home studio, uh, Secret Cove Studios. I hadn't plugged that into the graphics yet, but uh, this is where I do most of the work that I do, the majority of the work that I do. Uh, in the studio, and I'm taking you through something today that uh, I'm really, really excited about. Uh, let's see if this overlay thing works. One of the reasons we're doing this for free is uh, we've got a brand new piece of software that we're using to um, to do the live stream, so this lets me work a few of the bugs out. But also, um, I wanted to show you the kinds of things that we're doing over on my Patreon. And so if you were to go over to, which mouse is it? There we go. Uh, Patreon.com slash Brian Stevens. You can uh, check out some of the cool things that we're doing now on my little virtual clubhouse. That's what I'm calling it, clubhouse, on the internet. Um, one of the things that we do once a week is we do these live streams where either I'm walking through a plug-in. In this case, we're walking through something that I'm using it for the very first time while I'm talking to you. If you've got any questions, if you've got any comments, I can actually see those over here on my screen. And uh, we can always pop some of those up right on the screen as you have a question. Uh, if, uh, if I see one of your questions, we'll pop it up on the screen. We'll get it answered for you. And what we're looking at today is, uh, let's see if I can, there we go, point to it that way. I can see myself over there. <laughs> we're using this channel strip that's hanging around in the air right there. See, yeah, there we go, right there. That channel strip that you see came out this week. Uh, this is by a company called Waves Audio. That If you do any kind of recording, then you're very familiar with Waves and the Waves platform. And this is a brand new channel strip that's been completely redesigned from the ground up. For years, you probably already know if you followed any of my content, uh, not only have I been using the Waves uh, plug-in bundle, the Mercury bundle, the uh, Studio Classics bundle, the uh, Abbey Road bundle, not only have I been using those for years, uh, the predecessor to this particular plug-in, the SSL E and G channels, Views those on tons of mixes. It's the kind of thing that I go to a lot. And well, this is their brand new offering with the SSL EV2. And uh, as you can see, I have to look over here to see where I have to point. There we go. <laughs> it's it's like being a weatherman. So I'm looking over here. As you can see with this channel strip, uh, it has uh, all of the features that you would normally associate with an SSL channel strip with a few extras that we're going to talk about today as I'm using this live. And one of the first questions that uh, I get from a lot of people about channel strips is, oh, I've got plugins, I've got a compressor, I've got an EQ, my DAW came with whatever software you're using, Studio One, Cubase, Pro Tools, and it came with compressors, it came with EQs, it came with these different things. Why do I need a channel strip plugin? And there's a lot of reasons why, uh, in this case, there's a particular sound that you get with the SSL, uh, with the SSL family of products that is, it's very unique sounding for what it does. Uh, and really, and I'm going to flip over for a second. I'm going to show you a couple of the other things that I use on a regular basis. So right now there's uh it's popping something up for me to do here. I don't want to do whatever that is. Don't want to do what that is. All right. So uh, what you're seeing right here is actually a live shot of my uh, Pro Tools session that we're using today. And uh, what I've actually done, if you look in the plugin list, if you're in Pro Tools, then you have these two slots before you go into the whole list. And you can see I've got pretty much every major manufacturer, I've got their plugins. But if you go into, uh, before you get to this long exhaustive list of plugins, you've got these two slots right under the search. And uh, if you don't know how to get to it, I'll show you real quick. If you go to preferences, and then you go to mixing, you've got a default EQ and a default dynamics section. Now, I ignore EQ and dynamics. I just treat it as default number one and default number two. And so you can see right here 
that the ship's omni-channel made by Waves is the very first plugin that I generally go to when I'm doing any kind of mix. And uh, the reason I do that is that the, the Chef's Omni Channel is pretty much the combination of all the different things that I would normally use. There we go. All the things I would normally use in my selection of things on an insert for every single channel. So I've got this pre-section, which gives me some saturation, uh, a little bit of harmonic distortion, uh, my pass filters, and it has this cool... This isn't a, a tutorial on this particular plugin. If you want, there's three tutorials over on my YouTube channel, brianstevens.com slash YouTube. And you can, uh, you can see several tutorials of me using this. The reason I like this, this channel strip is it does the thing I used to need six different plugins for. Uh, but the thing that we're looking at today, and you'll notice in my number two slot, I have put the SSL EV2 channel strip. So let's take a look at this channel real quick right here in my session. I want to walk you through some of the components so that you know what these are. If you've never sat behind an SSL console before, some of this stuff is going to be a mystery to you. Uh, some things may look familiar. Some buttons and some knobs may react differently than what you think that they do. So what's, uh, let's walk through the, the channel strip real quick and uh, I'll show you what's new, what's different, and that sort of thing. At the very top left is one of the new things for this plugin, and it is a, uh, an input section where we can not only adjust the input trim from our source channel that we're, we're pointing at, we're also, because of this analog button, we're able to do some other really interesting things. So if I turn the analog button off and use this line adjustment, that's going to give me more or less gain. Think of it as uh, sort of a, an input gain adjustment, and it's super, super clean. So we're not getting any coloration. We're not getting any, uh, any kind of artifacting. We're not getting anything other than more or less gain going into the channel. And depending on what level your source for that channel was recorded at, you may need to uh, bump that up if it wasn't recorded with enough input gain. You may need to bump it back if you start to get some weird things happening going into this plugin. Uh, and uh, if you instance that analog button that you see at the top left, I'm pointing to my screen like I should be pointing to that. <laughs> um, not only do you get the gain, but uh, whether you're using the line input adjustment or especially with this mic adjustment, you can get some harmonic saturation. Normally what I would have done in the past with most of my channel strips, if I wanted some kind of console saturation, uh, I would have either instanced, Wave has got a, a few different console emulations that I could instance. Uh, Slate has a few of those where you could do Neves, APIs, SSLs uh, with the Slate version. There's a Trident console. Um, with Waves, you get three different emulations, one that's an SSL style, one's a Neve style, one's a Tube style. So this gives me some of that harmonic saturation depending on how hard I'm pushing this channel. And uh, I use that caveat of uh, use with caution. It's sort of like salt. You can over salt the, uh, the soup a little bit with this thing. Uh, some other things that are in here that are really nice. If you've got something that was recorded super, super hot, uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can adjust the gain for that. But this is a quick and easy way, especially when I have people that send me mixes to work on. Uh, the faster I can get to some of the tools I need to better. And this 20 dB is great for knocking something down going into this channel strip and it just does it automatically. I don't have to reach up and grab a knob, I just hit a button. Uh, also, we've got a polarity switch. If, uh, if I have two channels, like say two kick drum mic channels, uh, two snare drum mic channels, and I'm worried about the polarity, I'm hearing that they're out of phase, I can very quickly just hit this button, I can check the phase on that. Uh, moving down, we've got a whole compressor section that you'll see right here. And you'll notice that we have a limited amount of controls. We've got a ratio knob, 
which is the uh, ratio for the compression. We've got a threshold, which sets the level at which this compression kicks in. And then we've got a release for how quickly the compression lets go after we go back under this threshold. We also have a, a fast attack button. And if, um, if you look at the time that I have here, uh, I can set this at uh, 0.1 second, 10 milliseconds basically. Uh, all the way up through 20 milliseconds, all the way up through. Uh, uh, if if we hit this fast attack, I believe it's 0.1 milliseconds. Pretty quick. It squashes down pretty quick. Uh, usually what I do is I start with the regular slow attack on. That's not slow when we've got the knob dialed all the way to the left. One thing you won't notice on this compressor is there's not a makeup gain. Because just like the SSO consoles, uh, this has an auto makeup built into the circuit. So as I'm compressing harder, I'm hearing the effects of the compression, but the overall level is going to stay the same. So the compression doesn't play tricks on me. If I, if I don't have an auto makeup gain on compressor as I'm clamping down, it's going to get softer. And uh, when you bypass that plug-in, just the volume ramp that you're going to get could trick your ears a little bit. So, uh, so that's this part of the dynamic section. We've also got a gating and expansion slot here with uh, very similar controls. We've got a threshold, we've got a range, and we've got a release. There's also a fast attack. And this button can get us between gates and expansion. You'll see we've got some LEDs right around here that give us the amount of gain reduction, whether it's uh, gating expansion or compression left to right. Uh, then we get down here, you'll notice that we've got some filters. And this is uh, going to be a high pass filter. And we've also got uh, a low pass filter. And then we've got a split that we can talk about what this thing does later. Uh, if we hit the split, then we're able to reposition this, uh, these filters and where, what they, how they interact with the dynamic section. So um, let's move over to the EQ. Now you'll notice something uh, from the very, very top of this EQ strip. We've got two buttons here. We've got a button... And when I hit this left button, it's got a brown dot on it. You'll notice that these low filters change to brown. When I go over to the black dot, then these knobs change to black. We'll just call this the brown EQ and the black EQ. And what that does is that uh, changes the filters in the low frequency adjustments. It also slightly changes some of the other uh, adjustments in the high, high, mid, and low, mid EQ section. Um, to give you an idea of the subtle difference between brown and black, particularly in the low, where you see the color change, the low filter, uh, most people think of the, the consoles that had the brown EQs as having a little more gritty tone to them, no, not quite as pristine. Uh, gritty is just a general term. Uh, just like if we swap over to the black EQ, you get something that's a little cleaner, something that's a little more uh, pristine, if you want to use that word. Uh, and and they're these are very subtle differences. I have people ask me, you know, when I do some of these moves in mixing, they'll, they'll say, well, I really don't hear a whole lot of change. Um, you don't necessarily want a dramatic change on things. When you think about, like in the case of this mix I'm going to play for you, when you've got 40 plus tracks, like in this mix to work with, uh, any change that you make uh, compounds across those channels. So any EQ change that I make, any compression change that I make, when you make all those changes, the aggregate of that is going to have a, a big difference in the end result. So... Um, uh, we'll, we'll touch on that as we go. One of the things I really like that they've built into this is a, a listen button. So as you're adjusting any of these EQs, like if I'm going to adjust this high mid frequency, it's going to solo the thing that you're adjusting. So if I'm adjusting high mids, it will adjust, uh, it will solo that frequency range so you can hear just what you're adjusting. Uh, sometimes when I'm mixing, uh, and I'm mixing in context, uh, I, I don't always hear 
exactly what it is that I want. One of the ways that you can hear exactly where the middle of that frequency is, is to um, go and solo the channel. And a, a very typical thing to do is just to ramp the uh, attenuator up. So you might go plus 10 or plus 15 on an EQ with a really, really sharp Q, kind of one of these moves here. You see me taking the Q to, to a point. And then uh, that way you're here in the center point of that frequency really, really pr uh, prominently. And uh, so the great thing about this is it just takes all of that other content away so that you can hear just what you're adjusting. Uh, it's a quicker way. You don't have to do anything weird. One of the problems sometimes with doing that where you're uh, cranking that attenuator up, the, the volume for that frequency is that you can, depending on what's in your mix signal chain, you can have all kinds of weird things that happen. So this is just a cleaner way of doing that sort of thing. Now, um, you'll notice a few buttons. So, uh, and this is very typical of the SSL uh, infrastructure. So we've got a bypass for the dynamic section. If you want to hear your source with and without the uh, compression and without the, uh, really the whole dynamic section, you can just bypass it. Uh, if we hit, and this is the secret to the SSL consoles, really. And a lot of times when I, when I see people that don't know this world very much, they don't really actively make use of this. We've got a channel out. And what this does is it moves the compressor. So the way that this is set up stock without anything is that we compress and then we EQ. Compress and EQ. And as soon as I hit the channel out button, it moves that compressor to after the EQ. And there are a lot of cool things that you can do depending on how hard you push the EQ. You can do a lot of things EQing into the compressor or compressing the EQ signal, uh, especially if I'm trying to get um, uh, maybe a certain roundness to the sound, or maybe I'm trying to get a little fatness back in the sound. Uh, where I place that, place that compressor can have uh, an incredible difference in how I'm doing those. Let's see. Great start. Go ahead and get the plug in. Yeah, it's Black Friday, Mike. I, I, if you get this plug in, go to Brian Stevens. I didn't put that in there. I should put this. I should stop the webcast and put this in there. Go to brianstevens.com slash waves. And, uh, and that way, when you buy this plug in, then I get, uh, I get a few shekels. It helps to uh, offset the cost of uh, upgrades like we've done the last couple of months with the web streaming here. So, um, yeah, I would definitely tell you for Black Friday and the sales on right now, you can go get it right now. For If you don't have any of their SSL plugins or nothing in the Studio Classics uh, bundle, then this is $39.99, which for any plugin is super duper cheap, especially for all the things that you get. If you've got any of their SSL plugins or you've got the Studio Classics bundle, uh, it's a different pricing. If you've got one of those SSL plugins already, one of the legacy plugins, it's $29.99. And if you already have the whole bundle, it's just free. So when I updated my software earlier this week, it just came right into my bundle. So there you go. That's uh, that's the <laughs> the sales pitch. And uh, you know what? If I could do this a little quicker than I can, I would probably go and do something like, uh, well, let's try this. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go off camera for a second. This is the cool thing about... Uh... Brian Stevens. Hey, look at that. Put it over there so it's not throwing my face. All right, there you go. So if you go to brianstevens.com slash waves, um, you can uh, go pick that thing up for $39.99. Uh, it's, it's a great plug-in. I don't just say that because uh, uh, I get like five cents or <laughs> every time somebody buys a plug-in. But uh, uh, I say that because... It, yeah, it's they make great plugins. I, you, every one of my mixes uses uh, Waves plugins. I use Waves plugins a lot, uh, especially that Ships Omni channel. I have a feeling this is going to be one I use a lot. So um, 
Anyway, so what are some of the other the other features of this channel strip? You've got uh, you've got an output attenuation, and then you've got meters for the in and out. Now, there's one thing you won't see on this version of the plugin, which I need to go get a let's go get a stereo channel. So if I real quick, I'm going to put one of these on the keys channel. If you put this on a stereo channel, you get a whole extra section down here. And uh, this is a, a stereo width uh, sort of plug-in. So uh, if you've got a stereo channel that you want to narrow the stereo field on it without having to reach for or automate your uh, session, you can just grab that. And as you go towards the middle, it gets towards mono. And then if you go all the way to the right, it actually reverses right and left. So instead of having to go in here and, and go into your channel and change those, you can change it right in the channel strip. Super handy. Uh, it's only one knob, and it's already there. And for me, I'm on this um, Avid Dock. And so it I've got my knobs mapped already. I can just grab the knob that is for that, and then boom, all of a sudden I'm changing that. It has an extra wide knob, and I use this sparingly, but it's inc an incredible effect for certain kinds of things, especially in dense mixes. If I need something that's uh, on the outsides of the mix to move out to be heard, volume's not helping me, I can use this kind of, um, it's, it's a mid-side processing that has the effect of moving the sound outside of, I'm outside of my green screen there, outside of your speakers so that you get additional width. It's a really powerful thing, especially if you got some synth pads or some organs, or maybe it's a rock track where you've got these really heavy rock guitars that uh, maybe the guitars and the, the drums, like the overheads of the drums are competing a little bit to be heard. You can always use the extra wide on those guitars and kind of push them out a little bit. It's a great effect. Um, that's in the stereo channel. So that's something that you'll see is a little different. All right, so let's talk about this mix. Uh, this mix is something that nobody has heard, I don't believe. Uh, I pulled this one out of... One thing about I will say about doing tutorials like this is um, that... Put that into favorites. I'm going to try something because this is... Uh, Ah, there we go. Yeah, so one of the things that's new about the software that I'm using is I can actually pull the comments from, uh, if I get out of the way of them, I can pull the comments from uh, YouTube and Facebook and I can actually put them up. So Mike, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, definitely go get this plug-in. It's really, really cool. And then we just get rid of it. Cool. All right, so now I know how that works. All right, so um, one of the things I have to be careful of when I'm doing these two kind of tutorials in a public setting is copyright. So uh, I can't just take any old session that I'm working on at the time. In, in fact, most of the stuff that you see when I post something on social media is either something where I got written permission from a client to be able to use their stuff, especially if we're in progress, or it's something that I actually have part of the publishing on. And in this case, this is one I actually wrote for a client that we never used. So uh, so I'm using a session. I, I dug it out of the mothballs because I think I'm going to try and find someone uh, to collaborate or sell this track to. Uh, I had a hip-hop client back in 2003, 2004 that I wrote this track for, and uh, he basically never paid for it. So uh, we never did anything, and for the last, you know, 2004 to now, what was it, 15, 16 years, has been sitting on the, ch on, the, on the shelf. So I pulled it off the shelf to be able to show you how I use this and uh, to give you a quick idea of what's in this. I mean, we really did a real extensive... Um, I've got these in folders. You'll also kind of see my mix structure uh, as, as I put things together for a mix. So I've got about 45, 40 to 45 tracks of stuff. And so to help me with being able to keep track of all that stuff, I make uh, ready use of Pro Tools routing folders. Uh, and I use them for a few different reasons because not only with a routing folder can I put everything into one folder and close it up when I don't need to see it, I can also process that bus. A lot of times, like with drums, I'll put some bus processing on the whole drum mix. And you can actually do that through the routing folder now. Some, not something that you could do before up until these newer versions. So you'll notice that there's a lot of tracks here. We've got, uh, there's an intro kicking uh that you'll hear in just a second that only happens in the intro. 
I put it on its own tracks just to make it easier to mix. We've got a whole kit that's just loop drums. So that's uh, this two different loop kicks, a loop snare, and then two different hi-hats. You'll hear those in a second. Just walking you through the tracks. Uh, I cut some real drums. And uh, you'll notice that we've got an inside and an outside kick drum mic, snare, uh, two overheads, and a hi-hat. Uh, this is basically a four-bar loop. I played the whole track from top to bottom, and then for continuity and make it sound like hip-hop music, I just picked the best four bars, and, uh, and that's what we looped through this whole thing. But uh, one of the great things about this is, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm a consistent drummer, and granted, we recorded this thing like 15, 16 years ago. Uh, you'll notice the snare drums uh, are pretty consistent but they're not, uh, probably not as good as I do now where everything's uber consistent. But uh, the great thing about when we hit something like this with compression, it still has some life to it. It has some humanness to it. And uh, same way with the kick drums. If you, if you look at some of those, they're consistent, but there's a little bit of dynamic in there as well. So, uh, so we got a whole drum kit in there. And then you'll hear there's uh, these hi-hat things that we recorded separately. Uh, there's some percussion. There's a vibra slap. There's some claps and tambourines. Oh, that's my phone going off. That's my brother calling me. Scotty, I'm live streaming. Get on your Facebook. <laughs> anyway, uh, we got some percussion and stuff going on. I've got a couple of bass tracks. I've got four tracks of guitar, which is really two passes of guitar, two different amps, two different mics. Uh, so stereo guitar. We've got a wah wah. Then we've got a whole bunch of uh, other stuff that I played in. Now, these are all samples uh, or soft synths, but uh, I played them in like you would an orchestra. Instead of playing in like a keyboard player, like the strings one part is a single string part. We've got strings one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different string parts. Um, only three of them go through the choruses. Yeah. And then the rest are uh, scattered through different verses. We've got some different keyboard stuff you'll hear in a little bit. Got some cool ping pong uh, delay stuff going on that are just some keyboard sounds you'll hear. And then we've also got some horns. So this has got full on like orchestral, interesting orchestral stuff. We've got some um, just general brass sounds, I think are more like a group sound. Um, got some French horn sounds. And then I've broken out some stuff here in the, the end that I played which is trombone, trumpet, and barry sax and tenor sax. You'll hear those parts in a second. So uh, this is pretty typical. Oh, we got some alto sax that uh, ended up being in the, the final mix in a verse. Um, this is pretty typical of a hip-hop thing. Sometimes, I mean, this is 40 tracks. This is light compared to what I have sometimes. So uh, so let's jump in. I'm enough talking. I'm going to let you hear this. I'm going to bypass this. I'm going to let you hear this mix uh, and all I did was I just panned things hard left and right that were stereo and uh, might have panned a few things like these percussion just a little bit to get them out of the center and then uh, just did some levels. So this is bone dry. This is before anything's done. And uh, there won't be a vocal on this because uh, I stripped his vocal off of it because he never paid for it. We'll just listen to a little bit of this and you can kind of hear the track that we're dealing with. Kind of a rock Hip hop thing. Oh, go back in the beginning.
And then I'll skip to the end so you can hear some of the other stuff here. Let's see. Let's get past. Let's get into where all the horns and stuff start coming in. We'll go all the way to the, the end. Go to the end. Here we go. Check this out. So for the third verse, we end up having these little horn stab things. And then by the time we get to the chorus, it's it's kind of an all skate at that point. By the time we get to the the last chorus, that's the one thing that's a little different about these hip hop tunes is usually it's just repeating a lot of parts and you're you're lacing in a lot. Of, there's some ear candy stuff that we're going to lace into this, um, and you know by the end it's just sort of a conglomeration of all the stuff that you've heard. That's sort of the the way we get to the end. But anyway, let's. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the real drums first. So I'm going to kind of start from the standpoint of uh, mixing the drum kit and then mixing the rest of the track around that. So let me mute everything. And uh, I'm just going to show you this SSL plug-in. All right, so we're just going to go straight to our uh, kick here. Loop that. All right, our solo saved that. Check it out, if I hit this mic. Now, one thing I want, people are gonna scream at me. You're gonna see some clip lights go off, I'm just gonna tell you. You're gonna see some clip lights go off but in the case of this plug-in, it's okay. So check this out. I'm going to kind of ride the mic input and pull the line input back a little bit. It's okay if I'm hitting clip lights every once in a while. If I'm just totally in the... Check it out. That's when we have a problem. Uh, that's when you start to hear some nasty stuff that you might not want to keep. But if you're just kind of tapping this, this red light... You're fine. If you did the same thing on the console, you'd have similar results. So, so I'm going to trim this back a little bit as I'm... I'll find something that makes everybody happy here. That's without that. Again... There's a little bit of a level difference because I'm driving into this. But also, there's a little bit of something going on when I drive into this input circuit. So, in this case, just like the console, if I was if I was hitting that uh, to where I was hitting a few little clip lights here and there, I wouldn't worry too much about it. All right, so I'm going to crank down on the this, and we're going to see about getting some... So I've got a fairly fast attack. I could go super fast. You notice, especially with that threshold being, one of the things you notice is the snap comes off of the uh, kick drum. In this case, I don't want the snap to get quell on the kick drum. Uh, we're going to do that on, on another track, but I don't want to do that in this case. I'm mixing it in my ears. So one of the things I'll end up doing before I sign off on this mix is I'll listen to it in my speakers as well. But uh, so check it out. A couple of things I want to do right now. I'm going to go ahead and right now we're compressing and then we're going into the EQ. I'll go a little harder on this. I could go crazier than that, but I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I'm going to go up a little bit, clean up the sub bottom I go to eh, 
2530. All right, now let's take a look at this EQ for a second. The first thing I'm gonna do that I always do with the kick drum is get the nasty stuff out of there. So real quick, I'm gonna show you, we're gonna grab this Q knob, make it super small, I'm gonna come down here, and then I'm gonna, we're gonna do a couple things. Check this out. Normally I'd have to really crank that to hear what I'm doing. And as soon as I let go of this knob, it goes back to the full sound, which is cool. I'm trying to get rid of, I'll turn this up a little bit. In the, this case, there's some, I don't want to go that far down because I'm getting some of the lows that I like. Somewhere in that 300 range. That's just, there's nothing usable in that kick drum sound right there. So I'll let go of the knob. And I'm going to dump that pretty severely. Come down here into about the 80 hertz range. And then we're going to bump up a little bit of that low end. I don't want to bump too much low end on this kick drum because I have another kick uh, that we're about to take a look at. But then also I have some programming stuff that is actually going to go a little lower than this kick. So knowing that, I am going to uh, hit somewhere between 2 and 3K. And we're going to see if we can, I'll turn this on and let you hear it. Yeah, closer to 3, fair amount of attack there. Now, are you gonna hear a difference between the brown and the black? Eh, I'm not pushing it super hard. If I were to really push this thing hard, you'd probably hear the difference there. If you're if you're listening right now on a good set of speakers, you may notice the difference in this. It's super subtle. There's the black. Curves a little different, and the, the resulting sounds a little different. So I'm using a shelving EQ. So check this out. I'm using a shelving EQ. I'm not using the bell. I'm using the shelving EQ, but I'm I'm making sure that I don't dirty up the bottom end by making sure that I have the filters in there. Now, now that I've done all that work so far, I'm going to move the compressor. Listen to the subtle difference in, in this case, I'm not pushing this thing super hard, but listen to the difference between putting a compressor before and after. Before. Hear how it actually makes the low end thicker? Because the bit that I'm boosting in the high mid and the low is hitting that compressor and making it work a little harder. Make the release on this thing a little I can get a little more length out of it if I, if I let this thing release a little slower. Well, I have, watch what happens if I hit the fast attack. Kind of goes away, doesn't it? If I, even if I back off of this thing, just takes all the slap that I was wanting out of it. And so then I'm just using the release. If I get a slower release, then I just get a longer note, which is kind of cool. Might be a little bit much, com you know, considering I've got another one of these to go. Now, because it's been so long since I recorded this, I'm guessing, now one thing One thing I will say on that, you'll notice I'm really pegging this thing here on, on the out. So for me, just so I leave myself some headroom in my mix, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trim the output back. I mean, I'm hitting the, the input of the plug-in pretty hard. But so that I have some headroom once I put everything back in, I'm going to trim this uh, back on the output. 
I'm guessing this is a large diaphragm condenser out in front. So real quick, I'm just gonna copy this, but that's only so that I can keep some of the stuff like the compression. I wanna get rid of all of this, um, all this high. And even then, probably more highs than I want. bring this down just a little bit so one of the things I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this high mid out that I boosted but check it out what if one thing I'm going to do is there's a certain part of that high mid I am going to use the gate in this case. I'm not going to completely get that snare drum out of there, probably. It's a little bit of click to it that I don't like. That's without the two plugins. That's with the plugins. Start on a pretty decent kick drum sound there. Bring this in and let's work on the snare drum a little bit. It's a pretty dang consistent hit. I'm gonna make it make sure it's super consistent. I went ahead and put this out in front of the EQ. Hit that pass filter, pass filter pretty high. Now, there's a few things. Somewhere in here, I'm going to dump some of that. I don't want to get rid of it totally, but I want to definitely dump a little of that. Uh, I'm going to go to... Uh, see if I can, this was a piccolo snare, so it doesn't have a lot of meat to it. I'm going to give a little meat back to it. 40, bring this down a little, kind of work the, again, work the high pass filter against the low, low filter, and again, I'm going to go over to the, go over to the brown, there's a little subtle difference there between the black and the brown, that's, to me, that's snappier for some reason, I like that better. Not in this case, I'm not really. Maybe I'll use an expander. Definitely cleans it up. So that's the snare drum without that dynamic processing. Just focuses the thing. And of course, just to give it a little more air, let's crank a little bit 10K on it. Because I don't have a bottom snare drum mic on this thing. Just a top mic. Alright, let's look at the overheads. Wow, we're already 50 minutes into this. This is crazy. Of course, I didn't mix with this thing yet. Alright. I'm going to trim this back a little bit. I'm going to drive this a little bit. 
it automatically just doing that just sounds better to me. Now if we need to, oh, on that snare, yeah, let me trim that back again too. Just in context. Just brings out the stuff I like about the snare drum more, and it quells some of the things I don't like about that snare drum. All right, now let's go back over here. I'm gonna drive this a little bit and get a little bit of a little bit of that in there. You'll notice there's no crash cymbals in this. Basically, I'm gonna use this to knock down the snare drum and the overheads a little bit. And in the case of the compressor now, the faster, I mean, the higher, I, the more I'm compressing this, like I'm getting up to six dB again there. The more the snare drum just seems to pop for me. It's kind of pulling the middle down so that the mic, um, the mic really sits. The mic track sits really nice there, and then it, it kind of makes this high that hi hat on the outside a little more prominent. It's the same thing here. I'll pull this down mainly because make sure I'm not in. out of prefect metering. Main thing I'm trying to do with this is the reason I don't want to see yellow lights is not so much the you know overloading the channel of the bus is that I'm gonna eat up the headroom that I've got on my mix bus which is down here. I'm gonna eventually eat up my headroom and I'm gonna have to have problems managing that later. So that's really the main reason why I'm trimming back on the, the output. Now check this out. That's the extra wide. Now if you're listening on speakers, you may hear a difference in this. So it does some mid-side processing to knock out what's happening way in the middle and push these things out. Now, I may not want to hear it with such stereo separation or I may want to move the hi-hat to the other side and just do that one knob instead of adjusting these two knobs here and here on the channel I can just do that adjustment in the plug-in right there now the hi-hat moves over to the left side I don't like that I'm gonna keep it there I don't like the extra wide in this case because really if I were if I'm being honest I wouldn't go wide right and left with my overhead mics I usually do that with my rooms, and I come in about 20%, 30% with my direct overhead. So I'm going to do that 20 or 30% with this. All right. Pretty good start. Now, I have a hi-hat here. And the thing about it is, I don't usually I use an SSL channel strip basically to do this. Take all the lows out. I do the fast attack. And I use the compressor in the SSL to basically knock the snare drum down in the hi-hat mic. I mean, that's what I use it for. Uh, I'm just doing the same thing. Now, I'm gonna, I am going to add some air to this just a little bit. I just like that. So now, as I'm putting this mix together, I'm going to kind of use this as a volume knob for my hi-hat. All right, so let's listen to this without these plugins. It's a little quieter because of the, the gain settings, especially on the output. But the main thing that you're hearing is it's a more controlled sound. And I need a more controlled sound because of all the things that's coming after this. All right, let's do something real quick. Let's put in two things. I'm going to do two auxes. And for now, I'm going to put them inside of the drum folder, real drum folder for housekeeping. But I'm going to send the outputs to the mix bus. 
All right, so we're going to call this first one drum verb. The second one, I'm going to call this one snare plate. Because we, we're probably going to do two different things with this. So we're going to pick a nice drum verb that we like. Let's uh, put this on a bus. I need to make some more buses later. Put this on its own bus. And then uh, let's go find a really, I'll show you, this is not a Waves product, but I'll show you the reverb that I'm absolutely loving right now. And I put it on a ton of stuff. I got to look around my camera here. Um, I put this thing on a ton of stuff. All right. So this is an uh, Eventide pro, uh, product called T-Verb. And I'm just going to go and I'm going to grab their... Yep. We're going to just grab their... They call it drum run. And basically what this does is this uh, is basically a, a room that you can set up the, some of the parameters for. And three different mics at three different distances. Like mic number one right now is at uh, 17 feet. Or no, sorry, that's mic two is at 17 feet. Mic one is right in front of the source. Mic two right now is at 17 feet. I'm going to move it back to about 20 feet. And then mic number three is 70 feet into the room. Just so I kind of get my, my three to one rule happening. It should really be, oh, I'll put it at 16. Kind of a three to one rule. So I've got individual control over the direct mic that's in front of the kit, which is this one. Right now it's muted. Then I've got a this second microphone here, and then I've got a third microphone that I can dial in. So real quick, I'm just going to put, um, I'm going to put all three of these into that drum verb. I'll put them all at zero, but I can already tell you I'm not going to send that much of the kick drum. Because I don't want to cloud up the low end too much. All right, it's going to be a, a bit much at first, but then I'm going to pull it down. Swap over here. All right. The other thing is, I want this, i uh, changed my mind on this here. I'll put that in there. Like that. Uh, let's see. Something else in 3 4? Nope. Why do I not see that going into 3 and 4? Oh, you know why? Because I wasn't looking at the track type when I did that. Sorry about that. All right, check it. I don't want to lose that. Made the wrong. This is great for a tutorial, isn't it? I didn't look around my thing here. I'm going to make aux tracks, not audio tracks burn. Somebody was screaming at me, I know. Those are audio tracks. Dang it. I know. Drum verb. Snare plate. I have this big honking camera right in front of me. I'm having to look around. Sorry about that. You're seeing my screen completely. Uh, all right. So both of these. Go to the mix bus. No, come on. Go to the mix bus. Um, now I'll put that in 3-4. Sorry about that. That's a different technique. Um, let's see. All right, now we should uh, be able to move that over here. All right, here we go. So 
So what's cool is if I want a bigger verb, sometimes that that if you especially if you move that first mic out, you can get a kind of nice effect to it. It's got compression on each of those. Nah, I'm not gonna use that. I am gonna pull this back though. I like having a little bit of this little high low EQ thing. I don't want it to get crazy. Basically I'm trying to make the decay go away by the next beat. All right, and then I um, don't tell waves, but I'm going to use a plugin that's not, another plugin that's not theirs. Uh, I I really dig the crap out of this uh, 250. All right, so a lot of times because I generally want to have a little extra verb just for. I'm gonna clamp. All right, so I'm hearing a little something. I'll let you hear what I'm hearing. Right in that 300 range. Let me use a wider. I know somebody was screaming at me. Brian, 300's killing me. All right, and why not add a little bit of lows to that overhead? So now I've just got a little. It's just a nice little room on there. That's all it is. Uh, and then the snare plate. Uh, a lot of times I just like to have a little bit of extra tail just on the snare drum that's completely independent of the rest of the kit. So, open that 250. I'm just going to, I'll just use one, because you're going to grab one of their presets. We'll grab one of their presets too. We'll grab their snare verb. I'm going to go all the way wet. I'm actually going to move that to 20 milliseconds. All right, so check this out. It's a little long, but that's okay. I'm going to pull it back once I get something that works for me. All right, so where is your plate? There we go. Now, let's trim that thing back. I don't want to put a gate on it. I want the I want that verb to open up a little bit after the snare drum. So it does it's not that verb's not hitting that plate verb is not hitting right when the room verb hits. It's not hitting right when the kick hits. It hits a little after all that stuff. All right. Because I told you about this button. Just wanted to check it. All right. So it's just a nice, nice tight sound. There we go. And one of the reasons why I'm I put these two verbs over here in the same folder with the real drums is it's just housekeeping, so that I know that that's what that's for. And uh, later I can always move it if I need to. Real quick, I'm gonna put uh, put back in. two bass. All 
All right, so I'm, I'm going to do something that I would normally do on a rock mix that might not work for this. Uh, and we're going to use this SSL to do it. If you got any questions, uh, let's see. What's up? Hey, JR, good to see you, buddy. Let me put your comment on the screen. Look at that. You probably did, uh, said something to me like forever ago. What up, brother? Good to see you, buddy. Uh, sorry if it took me a little while to answer you on that. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we're going to put an aux track in here. And I always do some kind of uh, bus compressor. And again, we're gonna, I'm going to put this. Uh, we're going to call this drum comp one. I'm going to, I got to look around my camera again here. Uh, let's make that a weird kind of brown. I can see what that is. All right. So we're going to go to the mix bus. So if you don't know what my signal path is, all my channels and all my groups and all my effects are going to a mix bus before they hit over here on this um, master bus. I can probably turn that Sonarworks off. Uh, I use Sonarworks on my speakers when I'm, when I'm mixing. Um, you probably already hear a lot more low end. Um, so I'm going to take this SSL and we're going to make a parallel compression out of this. So uh, I'm going to send this to 7, 8. Now, I'm going to take the main kick drum mic, and we're going to send it to drum comp 1. I'm gonna, and I'm going to take the yeah snare drum. So kick and snare, actually, let's just do this. Let's go both of those, and then copy that over. All right, so I'm going to send the main kick and snare to this, and we're going to squash crap out of it. It makes it twice as loud just because I'm already sending something. Now, here's what I'm going to do. Hit the fast attack because I want to take a little of the attack of this off. I'm going to go pretty heavy on that. And then we're just going to get up into some serious faster. All right. So then I'm going to go down here to about 80. Touch it up a little. A little air on it. And then I'm going to move that to after the EQ. You notice when I move it, look at how much uh, gain reduction I'm getting if I have the compressor before the EQ. A lot. But if I move it after the EQ because I've boosted these frequencies, getting about four more db of gain reduction so what it's basically doing is it's lopping off the front part of the note and giving me more on the back end so it just makes it fatter i'm gonna send that in that's nice cool All right. You'll notice a lot of my faders are a little lower too. Like I'm 10 down on most of my faders. There's so many tracks when I put them in, I'm trying not to eat up the headroom on my, uh, my mix bus. So I start with all my faders down by 10 dB. All right, now. So this is a synth bass. Now, if I drive that, I get a little bit of a harmonic distortion by driving the line. Cool. All right, let's do a couple things. Because I've got some sub-harmonic bass that's happening. I'm going to high-pass this thing a little, a little higher, like around 60 going to tighten up the main bass sound because I've got this other sound. You're not going to hear this if you're watching this on the phone, by the way. I'm trying to leave room for that. So I'm knocking a little of that off of this sound. Bring out a little of the resonance. 
from that sound. And then check this out, because I want to leave room for the kick drums. I'm going to go down here in that 250, 300 range. Well, let's go further down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to knock out a little of that sound. Now let's go down to it. So instead of just jacking this, take that solo off that. Doing a kind of a combination of things. I'm getting rid of some stuff that I don't want, and I'm adding back. Uh, some things that I do want, and it's the aggregate of that's going to help all the stuff sit together. So that's without it. It's subtle. For some reason, putting that compressor after just makes it sound better. It just sounds more interesting for some reason. All right. Put that back into the track there. Doo -doo -doo -doo. All right, I'm going to copy that over. But in this case, I'm going to bring this down to about 20. And I'm actually going to high pass this. Because if you notice, there's some stuff kind of happening up on the top of that that I don't want to keep. All right, so one other thing I'm going to do real quick is I want to carve a little something out so that, so that the sub bass and this other bass sit really well together. So check this out. If you're listening on the phone, you won't hear this. Right in here, I'm going to take some of that out. I'm just going to make, with the bell, I'm going to make a little bit of an extra little dip in the sub. So I'm kind of creating these little little pockets that the other bass can sit in. So it makes it easier to blend the two of them together. If this weren't a keyboard, if this were like a, a regular bass and a keyboard synth bass, I'd probably put them both on a bus and compress the bus too. But for now, I'm going to leave it like that. All right. Listen to these guitars. I think one of my interns played this. I think when we did this, I, one of my interns at the time was a guitar player. I think I had him do this. Use a little high pass, clean up the bottom end of that. And the same thing here. Let me solo this so you can hear it. I'm going to go over to the brown EQ because it's just going to sound better for this. I'm going to go down. Hear this. None of that sound is useful in a guitar. It's just crap. So I'm going to go with a eh, very narrow, narrow Q. All I'm doing here is I'm just cleaning out some of the stuff that's going to get away, get in the way of those things that I want. You know, there's bass, there's kick drum, there's other things that are living down there. Um, that if I can clean this out a fair amount, it's just going to make for a better sound all the way around. So between cleaning that out and raising this up, I can go a little bit lower with that now. Set about 70. All right, um, I'm not boosting high end on this. I'm just gonna copy that over and see how that works. There's two different cabs and two different mics, but they're similar sounds. The one on the right's a little brighter. Since the one on the right's a little brighter, I am gonna go back to this EQ and I am gonna put a little air in. Just put a little air back into this other side. 
And again, it's one of those where because I didn't do it in both of them, it's it's just better. It, if I pulled both of those up in both sides and then I copy this over, it's just going to be too much of a good thing. So I'm going to copy both of those, but I'm going to reverse the uh, stereo imaging. So now... So I'll listen to it that way. Listen to it this way. To me, it just when I swap these, the left and right on these two guitars, it just makes it it makes it less obvious that it's two guitars, but also it just does something in the middle of the sound that uh, that I like better for this mix. Now check it out. I can kind of ride either one of these if I want to. Let's put it back in the mix. All right, so without it, let's do it with and without. Let's see what it sounds like. With it. There you go. Just sounds like what it should sound like. All right, so now it's missing something. It's missing some dang rim. All right, so let's, uh, I won't make that same mistake twice. I'll go ahead and name this. Uh, And same kind of thing. I'm going to put this inside of um, this raw guitar file so I can bring them up and down together. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to go ahead and actually, yeah, you know what? Uh, instead of going to the, straight to the left-right bus for now, I am going to make it go out of the track rock guitars. Uh, where I'm doing this routing folder, the verb and the guitars are all coming out of the same bus to the mix bus. That way, if I move them up and down, the verb and everything moves together. All right, so I should probably use a waves, uh, some sort of waves reverb since uh, we're doing wave stuff anyway. Um, yeah, let's put chamber on it. Why not? I was going to put a room on it, but heck, let's just use a... Let's... Uh, I just pull from one of these wonderful presets. What do we want? Let's let's do this. Let's um I don't know what an acoustic mirror is. We're about to find out what an acoustic mirror is. If I don't like it, I'm gonna change it to something else. All right. Uh let's see. We're gonna put uh put all these bad boys into this verb. Go down, go down, go down, guitar verb. Put them all in there. I'll see what it sounds like. Without it. Let's give it some space. And it's gone by like the next beat, beat and a half. Without it. All right. Now we're cooking with gas. Clean this up a little bit. air on it. I'm going to compress this a little bit. Because I want to bring the inside of the rhythm out. That t -t 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 -t. The downbeats 
they're naturally going to just jump out anyway. I want the inside of the rhythm to come out. Because I want to sparkle a little bit more. Right around that five and a half, six K. It might compete with some of my cymbal stuff later, but all right. And again, so oh, do that. So so you can either use verb to put something in a place, give it some space, or you can use verb as a, I don't know, another part of the tone color. So check it out. Let's do this as a monitor. I'm going to grab a spring. Let's send this right to the mix bus. I'm going to put a little spring reverb on this because the, because the sound of it, I want it even more metallic than it sounds. I want to have a little more of a metallic sound to it. Uh, and just give it some character. That's the other thing. So, let's see. What do I have? I got something the other day that I liked a whole lot. Where is it? Yeah, here we go. I think this is it. Let's see what this sounds like real quick. I'll solo both of these so you can hear them. All right, so actually, let's just make it happen. Where are you at? There we go. Now it's a make a bus play. All right, so check it out. Yeah, that's it. That swimmy, swishy kind of thing. So I'm going to take all the dry out of it. Now, I can... I can... Yeah, it gets a little too swimmy. I don't want to get... Just give it a little character. So I'm going to put that... It's just a tone color that gives it, it's, it's, it's a kind of a low mid, midi range kind of air, airiness. It just gives it a little sustain. That's a word I'm looking for. All right, so real quick. Curious. Obviously, the gains are a little bit different. So there you go. That's that's just part, and I'm not. We're not going to have time for me to sit and do this entire mix. We're already an hour half into this. Uh, here's what I'm going to do, though. I'm going to go ahead and mix the rest of this. I'm going to bring in the loop drums. I'm going to bring in the percussion. Bring in all the different uh, strings and horns and keyboard stuff. I'm going to put a full mix together of this using this one channel strip. One of the other things that channel strip plugins do uh, is. One of the reasons to use a channel strip as opposed to a bunch of bunch of plugins and sequences, it speeds up your workflow. I could put uh, an EQ, a compressor, and um, any of the other things I'm doing, I could kind of put a whole line of those things in. Or I can just instance one channel strip and just go to that. And then when I've got to make changes, 
the interaction of that stuff is such that, especially with this SSL, I'm digging how this sounds. It's just punchy and it's got, it's sweet. It just, it makes things sound better. And that's, that's the big thing for me is, uh, it, does an EQ do the job that you want it to do? Does a compressor do the job that you want it to do? Does it EQ? Does it compress? Does it delay? Does it do whatever the thing is that you want it to do? But does it also improve the sound? If you, Because a sound that's already really well recorded, it's going to sound good. But can we take good and make it sound great? That's the big thing. Can we make, does that, does this channel strip make stuff sound better? Heck yeah. If you know how to use it, this thing makes it sound a lot better. You can just kind of hear the difference between the two so far in just what we've got going on. And it's incredibly versatile. I can, I can make this thing sound a a variety of different ways, do a few different things with it. I can use it as a bus compressor. I can use it um, uh, in a variety of different ways. I could even probably, the thing I haven't done is I haven't EQ'd my verbs. Uh, I could pull this channel strip and like I'm sending it to a, the console, uh, in a real console, I could put an SSL, let's say, after this uh, uh, wrong mouse, Brian. I could put one of these SSLs right after my drum verb. And if I want to make sure that I didn't have uh, any weird low mid stuff going on, I could actually EQ that. I'm going to kind of just do, I know, I know what this is going to do, uh, even without listening to it. I could also add a little air to it. And if I wanted to maybe add a little compression to it, put a fast attack on it, and then high pass it so that whatever's happening in that room, now I've got some of that EQ control actually on the reverb, but uh, it's nice to have a channel strip I can throw on top or right after this uh, this verb to just control a few things, Con control the low end, uh, make sure I don't add back some low mid stuff from the plug-in that I was trying to get out of the drums in the first place because that room sound is going to have a little bit of its own uh, low mid stuff that I may need to carve out it may get in the way of stuff and then air if I can put air on there not necessarily brightness but air open the top end up and just make it sound more open then uh, yeah, I can grab a channel strip like this and all of a sudden I can put it on my my verb and you'll notice I'm getting a little bit of compression off the snare drum into the verb What does it sound like without it? It's gonna be subtle, but there's a difference. Just makes it sparkle, and there's something in the low mid that, that just knocks out. Makes it a little clearer. So, you know, if I were to run that back through a console, that's one of the reasons to run it back to a console, not just for level, but for uh, for tidying that thing up, just doing some little surgical things with it so that it sits better in the mix. And as we add stuff to it, uh, to that mix, there aren't elements of that verb that are getting in the way of some of these other things. We've got horns and strings and all kinds of stuff that are going to take up some space in different places that that verb may be eating a little of my real estate up in. So, uh, yeah. So speeding up your workflow is one thing that a channel strip is great for. Also, one thing about using a channel strip like this across every channel on your mix, and right now we're only a few deep into this, but let's see what our system usage is so far on this. This thing doesn't eat up. Oh, you know what I need to probably do? Oh, I'm already there. The aggregate looks like it's a lot, but it's really not. We got a lot of tracks we're already playing back, so. Nah, I worry me at all. Yeah, so for as many instances of, of this channel strip as I have so far, to only be hitting that much, yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad at all, actually. Uh, I'll be able to get through the rest of this mix and probably only add 20% more of the processor. Um, so it's not super heavy on the, on the CPU. Um, yeah, so w the, the point I was making was if you put this plug-in, this channel strip plug-in across the entire mix, it has the same effect as actually using a console uh, like this SSL on the entire mix. So there is, 
there's a, a cohesiveness, a glue that happens by putting all of these uh, these channels through the same kind of channel strip. Uh, there's a sheen, there's a glue, there's a thing that happens to the overall sound that just brings everything together, makes it sound like it belongs together. And um, ultimately, it's going to be a character uh, to the sonic fingerprint of the mix that helps to, hopefully, if it's a good channel strip and it's got a good sound to it, it's going to add some kind of interesting specialness, some... Uh, saucy goodness or whatever you want to call it. It adds uh, it adds that very um, subtle but tangible thing to your mix that gives it a sound. Uh, if it were just compressing and just boosting or cutting frequencies, it would be no different than any, any other plugin you probably already have. But the fact that all these have their own sound, uh, and it's a stinking good sound, uh, it's the same sound that you've heard on probably all the records that you've ever really liked. I would say 80% of the records you probably liked have that SSL sound to them. We're probably mixed on a disc. If uh, Chris Lord Algae mixed on it, it was mixed on an SSL. I mean, heck, so many of the things you hear today, that's what they were mixed on. Um, yeah, I, so far I'm digging this. It's easy to use. It totally makes sense. The, the, the knobs do what I would expect them to do. And it has the reactivity that I would expect from this kind of thing. So um, I, I dig this plugin. It's totally worth forty bucks. Uh, and just the fact that uh, if you th if you think about it, for forty bucks, you you just added an SSL console to your recording rig. It's totally worth it to me. So uh, I'm gonna stop the web stream now, and then I'm gonna finish this mix, and I'll record that process. And uh, like I said before. Uh, I do have, we'll go back to my other thing here. Oh, actually, I can put it here, I guess. Um, go back to my camera. Ah, there it is. I need to be able to put that. Yeah, there we go. Patreon.com slash Brian Stevens. Get, let's get rid of that channel strip there. Um, these are the kind of things that we do. So if we've been hanging out for the last hour and a half while I've been using this channel strip. Not only are you able to see how I use a channel strip like this in the mixes that I do, you also get a chance to look at how I set up my mixes. So, so much, so much that I see from when people send me rough mixes uh, from what they've done in their home studios, one of the big differences, not only in how I'm able to get around the mix, but how I'm able to make the thing work and sound great when I'm putting these mixes together, compared to what you can just do at your house, uh, is some of this housekeeping, how I've got things put together, how they're grouped, how they interact with each other as I'm doing the processing that I'm doing, as I'm doing the mix moves that I'm doing. Uh, you're getting to see all of that. That's the kind of stuff that is we're hanging out on the Patreon. You get to see how am I putting my mixes together? Um, I'm going to see if I can. I've got two mouses here. I'm going to have to find a way to, to do this in a way that... Uh, Let me add real quick. Just add that. I have two different mouses here and two different keyboards. There we go. Patreon.com. We'll put it over here. So if you like this kind of thing, if you find this kind of thing informative, uh, if you find it uh, uh, helpful, and you'd want to do this on a regular basis. That's what my Patreon clubhouse is for. So if you go to patreon.com slash Brian Stevens, um, there's different membership tiers. And as a part of that, uh, you get these weekly hangouts, just like we're doing. We've been hanging out for an hour and a half. I'm showing you how I use this new channel strip. Uh, hopefully show you a few tips that you didn't know ahead of time that you hadn't used before. Or maybe something like this bus compression. Maybe you didn't understand what bus compression was like. The one thing that's different in the, uh, the Patreon is that uh, there's a way, uh, an even easier way for you to leave comments and get real-time feedback as we're going. Um, and here, it's a little delayed because it goes through the social networks. But um, that's one of the cool things about these live hangouts is I'll hang out with you for an hour to two hours a week, sometimes longer. 
if if you're up for it, sometimes I will put an entire four hour mix up on my Patreon that you can sit as I'm doing one of these long mixes and see how I do everything from beginning to end. Uh, you can see how I treat different instruments, how I pull together some of my reverbs, um, uh, how I do some of this parallel compression. Uh, those are some of the kind of things that you get every week in the Patreon. Uh, you'll notice that there are also a lot of other extras. There's a whole drum sample pack that we just put up a couple of weeks ago, Brian's Drums Volume 1, and it's 130 samples from this drum kit that I had set up in my live room. It's a 1957 three-ply Gretsch round badge kit with a bell brass snare. And I think it's seven different kits worth of samples. So you get the dry samples, and then you also... So you got all those dry samples, but then you get six other treatments that include rim mics, that include overheads, that include different kinds of verb that I put on these things. So that uh, depending on how you like to work with samples in your production, you've got different kits to choose from. Do you like it totally dry so you can do your own thing, kind of like what we're doing here? Or do you like to be able to have things already sort of pre-done? You just put them in your sampler, you just trigger them with whatever uh, MIDI device that you're using, and then all of a sudden... There you go, Bob's your uncle. You got great drum sounds. Uh, that's uh, right there in the Patreon right now. You can go download them today. Normally, if I were to sell those, that'd be $30, $40 you know, for that one sample package. It's sitting there uh, as a part of all this other stuff that you get with your membership tier. Uh, if you're at that $30 a month membership tier, you get all kinds of other things. Like you get um, for that sample pack, I put the native capture sessions. So for the sample pack, I just picked the what I thought were the quintessential hit at different dynamic ranges for each one of those drums. But if, and so if you're at that $15 tier, you get that sample pack. But if you're at the $30 tier, then you're able to get the native capture session. You could actually go back to my Pro Tool session from when we captured all those things and pull your own samples. And I think I hit each drum at uh, four different, uh, three or four different dynamic ranges and there's four or sometimes five hits for each one of those drums. And every one of those hits is a little different. I picked the one that I thought would be the most general that people would like, but there may be some other hit in there that you like better that you think is different. Uh, most of the time when I'm doing projects like this and you'll see it uh, uh, on the Patreon, when I give <laughs> the rest of this, uh, I'm going to put the rest of this mix session on my Patreon for the, for the, uh, uh, paid members, you're going to see how with some of these drum samples, how a lot of times I make my own drum samples, whether it's from live drums or from drum machines. A lot of times I'll grab a drum machine, bring it in here, sample the stuff, and then process those samples to, you know, while some people may be just using 808 samples or SR18 samples or whatever that is, uh, you know, I'll take those samples and I'll go in and do some things to them like uh, putting them to the tape machine, uh, running through a cassette player, running through some kind of uh, preamp so that I get some kind of harmonic distortion getting uh, going. And I'll come up with my own version of those samples that's a little bit different, and that's what makes it into my productions. And it helps just to put a sonic fingerprint on the thing that I'm doing that makes it sound a little bit different. So uh, those are some of the other kinds of things that you get in the Hangout. So... For free uh, here on the social networks, I'm going to leave this up for a few days so you can see this. And so that uh, if you want to join over on the Patreon, you can. You can jump in the clubhouse with us. Uh, there's a Discord server that I'm on every day. And I'll be answering questions on the Discord server. I'll be putting some uh, FAQs for some of these things like what is parallel compression. Uh, you'd be able to go back into the FAQ and, and find that in the Discord server. If you're wondering, as I'm talking, what is he talking about parallel compression? You can get lost in Google, or you can go to my Discord server and, and go right to the post where I talk about what parallel compression is. It's right there for you. It's super easy to get. Um, and with the Discord server, it's the closest thing to actually being able to have a direct line to me all the time. So if, usually if you uh, put a question in there, you got something you need me to... Uh, listen to or look at, you just put it there on the Discord server. And there I am. Uh, usually by the next day, I'm able to to get to that and give you some kind of answer. Uh, answer your question, help you with a problem that you're having. Or if there's a new product that you got questions about, then all of a sudden I'm able to uh, to help you with whatever that, um, that purchase decision is. I'm sure I'll probably hear from uh, Mike after he picks up one of these. Uh, let's go back over that one. Uh, I'll hear from Mike after he picks up 
this SSL channel strip. And uh, did I do a BrianSteves.com slash ways? I guess I didn't do that. Or maybe I did. Uh, yeah, actually I did. Pull that down. So yeah, if you go to BrianSteves.com slash waves and you pick up any one of the Waze plugins, especially this channel strip, and you got questions, you go right to my Discord server. You just put that question in. Hey, man, I'm trying to do this. Uh, and, you know, usually by the end of the day or the next morning, I end up answering you and giving you some advice for that. So uh, that's how the Discord server works. And if you're on the, the I think I call it the ride or die tier, um, there's a $100 tier where you actually get uh, lessons with me as a part of that tier. So we actually... Uh, spend time listening to mixes that you're doing. Um, if you're a drummer, we talk about what you're doing. Uh, we'll actually jump on a Zoom call or a, a Skype call, and uh, it's a, it's a one-on-one -on -one lesson. So there are a few different tiers you can pick from. Uh, if you go over there to patreoncom slash Stevens and jump on a membership tier. So I hope you guys got a lot out of this. Now we're an hour and forty minutes into this uh, this whole. Uh, tutorial or, or walk through this SSL channel strip. Uh, I'm going to take another hour or two to finish up on the mix for this track. And that's going to be up for paid membership tiers on Patreon by Monday. And uh, that's it. That's everything I got for you. Thanks for uh, Mike and JR and anybody else that, that stopped by to check out the web stream. Hope you dug it. Uh, we've got a whole brand new setup. This has been a great chance for me to be able to get in here and um, make sure everything's working the way it should. Uh, make sure everything sounds the way that it should. I'll actually go back and watch this web stream and see and hear what you heard today. And um, see if we can make this even better. Yeah, there's a ton of stuff that we're doing over here now with some of this new gear that uh, we're going to be doing a lot more of this, this web stream stuff uh, as we go. So make sure you hit uh, that patreon.com slash Brian Stevens. Jump on a membership tier. Uh, hang out with me every day, every week. Uh, download some of the stuff that I leave for you. It's just a great way for us to be able to have a back and forth and for me to be able to help you as you're uh, doing mixes at, at home. Uh, if you're a drummer and you're trying to get better drum sounds, there are things that we talk about in the Patreon, things that I put up for you, make it a lot easier. Oh, if you uh, if you came to this by way of Fader Jocks podcast or uh, the Dial Drummer podcast, it's going to be starting up again next month. We're rebooting that next month. Um then you're going to get extras, things that didn't, usually it's anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes, sometimes even more, of bonus content that didn't originally appear in the public episode. So there's all kinds of questions that I ask and things we talk about with the guests on the podcasts. They just, those things just didn't fit into the podcast. And so we're able to put those in the Patreon for, uh, for our uh, Patreon members. And it's just a cool way to get even more stuff that you can use in making the stuff that you make for yourself in your own studio. So um, thanks so much for taking the time to hang out with me. I appreciate it. Hope you got a lot out of this. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and finish up a mix. I guess I will see you when I see you. Later.